nobody should be arrested or killed because they entertain a viewpoint which is different from the government. I believe that this is the only reform that we need to move Africa forward. Countries that advance are those countries that respect freedom of expression. To me, this is the most critical. Right now, if you go to Zimbabwe, we have journalists in jail in Zimbabwe. In Eritrea, all the journalists are in jail. In Egypt, uh, journalists and politicians have been jailed up. Look at Rwanda. In 2005, when Victoria Ngabiri said she was going to contest the presidential elections, she ended up in jail. In 2017, when there was a presidential election and Diane Rigara decided to contest the election, she also ended up in jail. Kagami won 99.98% of the vote. Look, this is why I get angry. This kind of nonsense is way too much in Africa. The tomfoolery and the buffoonery in Africa should stop. I wanted to uh, elevate or raise the economic literacy of uh, those who are ruling Africa. There are certain economic principles that you cannot flout. Now, for example, a politician would say, you know, take, let, let me take Nigeria, for example. Well, Nigeria is an oil producing country and yet fuel is always scarce are in Nigeria. Why? Because the Nigerian government and also the Nigerian people insist that because they are an oil producing country, they should be able to uh, you know, get access to cheap petrol or gasoline. But the economic fact is, given that Nigeria has open borders, okay, with at least three African nations, Nigeria cannot sell petrol at far cheaper price than in the neighboring countries. Why not? Because Nigerian petrol will be smuggled out of the country. And this is what is happening all the time. So it is this particular cycle which doesn't make sense at all. And I explain this in the book that the only solution is to remove the price control, buying petrol at the same price as in neighboring countries. If, Nigeria, if the government wants to make petrol cheaper for Nigerians, then they should pay the subsidy directly to their drivers. And that's why I entitled the book Applied Economics. Uh, for Africa because, because we have open borders and there are um, a lot of things that uh, politicians promise that they can't deliver in Africa, especially in terms of development. The economic system in traditional Africa made up of free village markets free enterprise, and free trade. Now, markets have been in Africa for centuries. Anybody who goes to the market will notice that African market activity has been dominated by women for centuries. 60 or 70 percent of Africa's peasant farmers today are women. And they produce the food crops, they bring the harvest to their homesteads, when they bring the harvest to their villages, they use that to feed their family. The surplus, they take the surplus to markets to sell. That's why they dominate market activity. Now, anybody could become a farmer, anybody could become a hunter, anybody could become a, a carpenter. That person doesn't have to line up before the chief's hut or palace to ask for permission to trade or to go to the market. It's all free. So this is what we call free enterprise and free trade. These things were there before the white man stepped foot on the continent. And it is important that uh, we continue with this particular tradition and build upon it. After independence, we brought in state-owned enterprises. State-owned this, state-owned that. It is totally alien from our, from our own culture in Africa.
there have been a mythology perpetrated by the colonialists about traditional Africa. They've always claimed that uh, when they came to Africa, Africa had no history. Africa had no viable institutions. The people were suffering under terrible and horrible traditional rulers. The dictatorship did not exist in traditional Africa. Now, on all important matters, the chief and the counselors will have to come to unanimous agreement. If they couldn't, they will call a village meeting and put the issue before the people, for the people to debate it back and forth until they reach a consensus. Once they reach a consensus, everybody in the village, including the chief, is required to abide by it. Now, these village meetings were commonplace across Africa. In this case, you know, the traditional system does not tolerate dictatorship at all in, us, in traditional Africa. So that was the way we were ruling ourselves, not by dictatorship, but by consensus. It is important that we understand that.